You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. Today, I chat to Tanya Grantham, Vet Rehab Therapist from South Africa. She has a practice in Benoni called Animal Health and Hydro. She is also one of our online pet health lecturers and last year did an amazing lecture for us called Winning with Wobblers. So I thought it would be a really good idea to get her on the podcast to dive deep into some of the things that she mentioned in that webinar. So today she chats to us about the challenges that our clients face when they have a pet that is diagnosed with wobbler syndrome. She mentions why she doesn't recommend swimming in these cases. And we also talk about the conservative versus the surgical approach. Some exciting new surgical techniques are being done at Fitzpatrick referrals. And she mentions exactly what they've been doing, how they've been using 3D laser printing um, to treat these cases quite successfully. So very, very exciting things happening in the surgical world of wobblers. So without further ado, over to Tanya. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Megan. And thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoy our chats always. So I'm looking forward to this one. Now, Tanya, we obviously in South Africa are so proud of you. For those of you that don't know, Tanya was a finalist in the IAVRPT Vet Rehab Therapist of the Year. Um, so, yeah, being a, being a fellow South African, I'm obviously super proud. We were w- right behind her the whole way, hoping that she would win. Um, but just being a finalist is an amazing achievement. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's really nice to talk about it a few months on because it sort of died down a little. And now this is bringing back all those memories. I mean, I was completely blown away. It was really super exciting, something I didn't expect. Um, and yeah, the journey, I mean, just be, like you say, being there, sharing the stage with so many people that we know that we've watched over the years that we look up to. And then for me to actually be put in that group, it was mind-blowing. It was completely mind-blowing. And also, I think so amazing that it was, you know, you were nominated by by the community, right? Um, So the community nominated and the community voted, um, which I think is incredible. And this is, I mean, it's an international community. So this is like people from all over the world. And, um, you know, being a member of, uh, on the board of the IAVRPT, I know how many nominations there were. Um, so they were like over 280 nominations. Wow. So it was, there were a lot of people nominated. Um, so to be one of the top finalists is really an amazing achievement. And we're super proud of you. Well done. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Yeah, and, and I agree. The, to have been voted by the peers, by your peers, actually gives it a, an enormous amount of value. Yeah. Um, for me as a finalist, um, because it's not, I mean, we all know our clients love us, you know, otherwise they wouldn't come back. And so the clients are going to vote for you, but you're right. When it is the peers, it's like, yeah, it's, it's been pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You just get some recognition for all the work that you've put in. I mean, cause I mean, all of us, and you know, I mean, every single one of us works hard and super hard in what we do, but to be recognized is something in our field. I think that. We need to do more. We need to recognize yeah. it because we have some amazing people in our field. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I'm looking forward to this next year. Who's going to be nominated in this one? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can't wait until we're actually able to be able to hand out the awards in person. So obviously COVID has um, put a spanner in the works a little bit. So we were hoping that our Cambridge conference would be this year, but it's now going to be next year. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think we'll be giving three awards out next year. Um, but yeah, it's super exciting. Thank you so much um, for joining me today. So we're going to be chatting about wobblers. Um, and you actually did a webinar for us, um, which was very kindly sponsored by SAPRA, which is our South African Association. And it was called Winning with Wobblers. And um, these are cases which, you know, I found in practice were quite tricky um, because they'd often come with this kind of um, there's this conservative approach or maybe surgical and the owner would come not really knowing what to do. Um, so they'd get referred to you uh, often before they would go down the surgical route. And it was like, well, maybe just see how the rehab goes and then you can make a decision. Um, how do you find these cases? I mean, are you seeing a lot of surgical cases or is it similar to, to what I've experienced? 
No, I think I do see um, a fairly even distribution of surgical versus conservative. Um, and, and I think the big, the big thing is that when we get them in and they haven't had surgery, the, the clients or the pet parent needs time to adjust to this diagnosis. Yeah. You know, suddenly my big, large, giant breed dog has a problem and it's a neck problem. And we all have our own perspectives about neck surgery in humans and even back surgery in humans. Now we've got this big dog. We don't know how we're going to cope. It's so mind blowing and so frightening that if we are able to treat them. So if the pain is managed and the movement's not so bad and we're able to treat them for a while, it, it creates that space for the clients to come to grips with the diagnosis. And then it enables them through us as the rehab practitioners to give them bits of information. Because when you get the diagnosis, and, and I know when I do a first consultation, I, I literally do bombard clients with information because I love information and I think that's what they need. But to process that takes a long time. And so if we are... I, I will often with the conservative ones say, let's work with them for a month. And in that time, obviously, I've done neurological examinations. I know where the dog started. If he suddenly worsens, then maybe we don't have a choice. We do have to go for surgery sooner rather than later. But in that time, I have an opportunity to actually impart my experience and my knowledge while with whatever's relevant to that particular patient. So from a rehab practitioner's perspective, I think we have a really big role to play in assisting our clients to make a decision. And for me, I don't have necessarily a cutoff. And I do this with all of my patients. It's, it's kind of like, where, where is the dog? And where is the client? And what are their abilities? Because when we're dealing with a giant breed dog, it goes and has surgery and suddenly it's quadriplegic. Well, how the, what are you going to do when that 50 kilogram Rottweiler comes home and you can't move it? So, so you know, and even the ones that I see post-surgery, many of them in the first two weeks can't walk. So there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of adjustment. So I kind of like, I kind of like getting them before the surgery because there's time for them to prepare. It's not such a big shock when the dog comes home and then we've built a relationship. So then they also know they're able to contact me or in a case of another rehab practitioner that they are building a relationship with and say, okay, this is where I am. Help me. Yeah. Before we, we dive into all the details um, for, for those listeners that maybe just want a little bit of a recap, exactly mm. what wobblers is won't you just um, tell us what condition exactly it is and in what um, type of dog breeds that we'll find it and age groups yeah okay so um it's mostly large to giant breeds and it has two presentations um the one is in younger dogs sort of two to three years and the other one is in older dogs around six seven eight and um, there used to be breed distinctions rottweiler's got it later and doberman's got it earlier and i might even have got it mixed up um but so we're talking big dogs we're talking great danes in south africa we're talking burbles which are bull mastiff type they're mastiff type dogs so they really are big and heavy and it really is an um a malformation and a malarticulation of the cervical vertebra. And it, so it will affect the way that those two bones or three bones or four bones come together. And with the size of the dog and the movement, that malarticulation makes those vertebra unstable in relation to each other. And as a result of that, we can get spinal compression or um, entrapment of the nerve roots as they exit the vertebra or a combination of both. And then what happens with time as, as with some thoracolumbar disc disease or even some um, spondylosis, we start to see bony changes in the vertebra. So we will start getting changes around the facet joints and we may start getting pressure on the disc. So the disc might start to protrude or bulge or even um, or even burst completely. And that's, and then we're in a crisis. Um, but even some of the bony formations may actually form um, onto the inside of the vertebral canal. 
So now we've got bone growing inside, encroaching on the spinal column as it moves through the vertebral canal. And then any movement that we have in the neck, obviously that bone will move and create a, um, a compression and a, and, a, and a pinching. So it's quite, when you, when you see some of the, um, the radiographs and the CT scans, it does give you, the 3D gives you a really amazing um, view of what happens. And it's quite frightening. Yeah, and the word instability, you know, you said there's, un, there's instability in the spine. That's a scary word. It's a mm. scary word for owners, um, right? And, it, you know, and I think sometimes for bed rehab therapists also, mm. you know, that we've got instability somewhere. And I think if we're looking at, let's say we're doing a conservative approach and a conservative treatment, is there anything that we should be concerned about? So any treatments that we potentially would do that would be contraindicated in these cases? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. And I think it does depend on the degree of instability, which is not always measurable, um, and the degree of symptoms. So I think um, I have a few um, uh, cautions that I would look at when I'm, I'm managing or treating a dog, particularly a conservative approach where we've had no stabilization or no removal of disc material or anything like that, um, is firstly, we need to caution the client about rapid and sudden movements. And I mean, I'm dealing with a Rottweiler at the moment who there's another two young adult Rottweilers at home. And so when those dogs play and it's really rough and there's a lot of haji bhaji and there's a lot of T-boning, those are like, you need to nip that in the bud straight away. So there's the owner awareness aspect of it. From a practitioner perspective, when I don't have stabilization, I'm aware of two things. Number one, if the dog will allow um, manual therapies and massage and release, I always do it really, really slowly because remember that that those muscle structures, that soft tissue is assisting to stabilize the instability. And if we work too quickly and too hard, if the dog will allow, some of them won't, but if we work too hard and we release too much, we will exacerbate that instability because we're removing the soft tissue stabilization that's there. So I have also researched, I'll come back to rehab as well. There's another one I want to mention, but with the instability, I've actually researched neck braces. Um, and I think, I think they have a role to play depending on the dog. I don't believe they necessarily create a stability. So it's not like we're going in surgically and we are fusing the vertebra or we are create, you know, doing something that stabilizes them. I think what it does is very similar to the back braces that I've made use of in Dushants with thoracolumbar spinal issues. It creates an awareness and a proprioception. So now the dog has a brace on and suddenly it wants to do the quick movement and it's like, oh, I've got something. Oh, I'm aware. I'm aware of my neck. And so I think that it can be a useful tool. Um, but I don't personally don't use them often and a lot. And maybe it is something I should investigate more in South Africa. But I do know that they are available more readily um, overseas and in the Northern Hemisphere. So yeah, so the, the braces, I think, have a role to play if you understand. So sometimes the client thinks, yay, the neck is stable. Okay. And so again, that's where our role comes in to say, no, no, no. All we're doing is we're facilitating an awareness and a slowing down of movement. We're not fixing the problem. Okay, so everything has, a, has an advantage and a disadvantage, and it's our job to actually be chatting about it to the best of our ability and knowledge. So be, uh, be careful with manual therapies, and even to some extent, some acupunctures can cause quite a lot of fascial release. So I'm always, I'm not going to stick 20 needles in. I'm going to be very cautious. I'm fortunate I, I am an acupuncturist, so I have that tool in my toolbox. To be very cautious about the extent to which you release the body's own stabilization of that area. And then the second thing is my personal preference is not to swim them. And the reason for that is because if you watch a dog in the pool, they will extend. So they will actually lift their chin and extend their neck, creating 
a great deal of more pressure on those areas where we've got the instability and possibly even the, the bony changes. So as we're asking for that extension, we may actually be exacerbating the compression of the spine or the nerve roots. So I prefer not to swim them, in which case I have rehabilitated. I have an underwater treadmill, which I do use, but I've had some dogs where the water therapy has been a no-go. And we have rehabilitated them conservatively using land-based exercises. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is definitely possible, but it's a very long road. So, yeah, I mean, I yeah. completely agree with you. Those cases I used to also put in the underwater treadmill, but then saying that I had one, you know, um, so I think it's just something as hydrotherapists, you know, I think that people that are hydrotherapists must think about, you know, these kind of cases and the angle of their necks. It's a really great point that you made. Um, let's talk about pain in these cases. I mean, mm. I've had a few of those cases which have been extremely painful. And I must say acupuncture has really helped these cases. Um, but then there are others that are not so painful. What is your finding around pain? How do you manage their pain? Um, and, you know, especially those ones that are extremely painful. I find this is really difficult for the clients. And when they now come into decisions, it's mm. one of the things that pushes them towards surgery because they just, they can't handle that, these um, sort of bouts of pain. And sometimes, you know, it's just a sudden screaming of mm. pain, you know, where there is a neural compression. Um, and it's really hard for, for us. And it's really hard for the owners to handle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's a really good and valid question. Um, and they will vary depending on the individual. So my, I do use acupuncture, as I've said, and I do think they respond really well. Um, so when I initially see a dog, and often they are, the, they just need to do something silly. And then, as you say, they're squealing, and then they're cowering and crouching. And that is a very difficult thing for the, for the owner to actually live with. Um, and even even me as a rehab practitioner, I, I mean, it's terrible to see the dogs that way. So from a, a veterinary pain management perspective and for the rehab practitioners that aren't vets, you know, the multimodal medical management of these conditions is paramount. It's not sufficient, in my opinion, to have them only on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So you would need to, if the dog is only on that, you need to hopefully have a good enough relationship with the referring vets to say, the dog is really sore. It's not responding. I need better pain management to be able to actually work with this patient. And then we're starting to look at things like gabapentins, um, maybe amantadines, maybe um, even some of the opioids. I mean, I think as vets, we all have our own preferences with regards to the cocktails. The important thing for me is that I think these dogs need to be on a drug cocktail, at least in initially. Um, and then as I start to add the acupunctures and the therapies, I will also explain to the client that we will have bouts of flare-ups. We will have the dog catching itself and being sore. They need to look at how, what is the frequency between these bouts. So if it was happening every day at food time, and now it's happening every couple of days at food time, they need to be aware that it is progress, number one, because, because everything is a continuum. So we talk about the the... Um, frequency or the interval between bouts of or between flare-ups. And the other thing that I look at, ask them to try to measure is the intensity of the flare-up. And how long does it last? So let's say for some of the dogs, I had a little beagle when he ended up like that, he would be painful for three days. And eventually that became, well, I'm only painful for four hours. Okay, so it is still very distressing for the clients, but I think that we also need to see that as, yes, we are actually winning in a sense. If, though, the pain is so severe and the owners are in, you know, they're in tears and they don't know what to do. If, if for me, usually, if the dogs don't respond within two weeks, then I'm going, you know, like where we don't see some improvement, it's not going to be 100%, then I'm going maybe we need to consider a surgical approach. So it's my job and as the practitioner or even as the vet to be going, okay, I see these, your dog is not responding. In fact, it's spiraling. 
into more intense bouts of pain. And despite everything that we're doing, we're not getting a release. Therefore, let's talk about surgery as a, as a way of managing that um, acute pain. And what are our surgical options in these cases? Okay, so I think, um, I think it depends on the pathology that's there. Most of the dogs that I have treated that have had surgery have had um, disc herniations or disc protrusions or extrusions. So then it becomes a question of um, what we do is a ventral slot decompression. So we actually go in on the underside, on the ventral aspect of the neck, move out, move out of the way all of those, you know, the, the trachea, the esophagus, there's uh, all the nerves, the jugular. I mean, you've got to move that all out the way to access the ventral aspect of the, of the spine or the vertebra and then we bore um bore away as portions of the bone so that we can remove the disc material that is actually placing pressure um on the spine that's the most frequent procedure that i see but there are ways to stabilize with plates or um, we may have to remove portions of facet reactivity um, and i think that that would depend on the skill of the surgeon and whatever gets um, identified in the CT scan or the MRI scan. Um, and then if we've removed disc material, very often over time, those vertebra will fuse on its own without us having to plate them or do anything. And then we do have stability in that region. You mentioned in your uh, webinar, Winning with Wobblers. And for those of you that are interested, if you're online Pet Health members, you can just log straight into your portal um, and you can just search Wobblers. It'll pop right up. But you mentioned about um, some new techniques that Fitzpatrick referrals in the UK is actually doing. Can you just touch on that um, very briefly for me? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's really exciting when you start finding these things. And so Dr. Noel Fitzpatrick, um, when I last looked, which was when I prepped for the wobblers a few months ago, um, he'd only really done a handful. So he's got two procedures. The one is a, um, is like a disc replacement um, where he has a, uh, like a gel type disc that um, I stand under correction and you can find it on the Fitzpatrick referrals website, but he basically designs it using a 3d printer. So it's very specific for the dog for fitting into that space between the vertebra. So he replaces the disc and then that disc is surrounded by a titanium or a, some sort of a, a capsule. And then he has four um, uh, screws so two go into the um, cranial vertebra and two will go into the caudal vertebra with the disc in the middle. And those are um, those will fuse with the bone from my understanding. So that was the one. So now we've created a proper cushion. Um, and I suppose in a sense, those um, screws will stabilize that area. So that was the one procedure. The other is a what he calls a ventral distraction fusion. Again, he's using um, 3D printer technology to create these, um, these uh, pieces that he fits. So on the underside of the neck, he uses a, a titanium bolt that goes between the vertebra that then acts to um, fuse with the bone. So we're getting fusion or stabilization. And then he's got screws that connect a bar on the underside of that. So he's connecting three or four vertebra, unstable vertebra using this bar. So again, they've got screws going in and then this solid bar on the underside. And his discussion with that particular technique is that it allows for dynamic movement with while at the same time reducing the possibility of compression. So that's when our problems come in. If we if we don't stabilize is the moment we get the movement and those bony extra um, growths, exostoses, actually then while they're moving, they pinch or they compress. So this technique seems to um, allow for a more natural um, movement in the, in the neck. And it's more successful if the dogs are still mobile at the time of surgery, if they already um, quadriplegic, then it seems as a success rate is not good. But he'd only done about seven or eight when I um, when I read on the website. So it's exciting. 
It's so exciting. I mean, technology now, how yeah. I love how it's coming into veterinary medicine. Like you see it really in the human medicine world, but it's really coming into veterinary medicine now. And yeah, it's exciting to have um, vets like Noel Fitzpatrick who are embracing it um, and yeah, yeah. putting it into to practice and trying things out. Absolutely. Very exciting. I'm going, I'm going to go and have a look at that. Yeah. Cool. So Tanya, when you are rehabbing these cases, what are your main goals in the, in these cases? My, ma- my number one goal is often pain management. Mm-hmm. Um, my number two goal is some sort of return to normal neurological function. So I do explain to the client in the absence of, um, of surgery that some of the neurological deficits may remain. So they may remain mildly ataxic. So I am looking for an improvement if we are putting the dogs, if we're starting to strengthen them. So that's the third component is strengthening. Often these dogs are now weak for a period of time. They haven't used their limbs properly. And my experience with neurological rehab is if we can strengthen the muscle, we can overcome a lot of the deficit. So the deficit stays, but because the dog has got more muscular strength, it's able to live better and cope better and move better with the neurological fallout. So that would be my third. So it's pain. It's can we get an improvement in the neurological symptoms? Three, can we strengthen to facilitate Um, functions of daily living with these dogs. And the fourth thing that we definitely have to look at is what is the home environment? So are there other big dogs? I've mentioned that. Are there slippery floors? Are there stairs? Um, Is it a a little old lady living on her own (laughs) with a Rottweiler? Because, whoa, you know, how is she going to manage that dog? for example. So definitely spend a lot of time on home environments as well, because we can facilitate the dog's quality of life a great deal by changing some of the lifestyle components that we'd find at home. Yeah, I mean, I'd say those are my main goals. Yeah. These are really challenging cases for yeah. owners. Um, you know, and like you said, it really depends on their environment. Um, and I think for some owners, it's actually just not practical. They just, their house and stuff, is ju- it's just not practical um, to have an ataxic dog. Um, and we have to be the ones who have to educate them, to tell mm-hmm. them, you know, like, look at your environments. Are there adaptations that they can make? Um, because often there are. There are things, yes. ramps and things like that. Um, so this is where I love house visits. You know, it's not always practical, um, you know, and having a rehab clinic to get to someone's house. And um, I think now, you know, with everyone's advances in technology um, for COVID, I mean, we could just easily do a little Zoom call, right? And get them to walk around their house and say, like, Let, just show me how you enter the house. How do you get in the car? And, and we can advise them really easily and not with a lot of time having to drive there. Um, so I don't know if that's something that you do now. Yeah, um, it it isn't, not in these, like I haven't had a new Wobblers for a while, um, but I definitely do like the video technology. So um, there's been a lot of controversy around Facebook and WhatsApp and social media, but I mean, we use WhatsApp a lot. And then I'll say to the client, send me a video. Yeah. So they, so for home exercises and those kinds of things, we make use of it a lot. So yes, for the client to actually take the phone, <laughs> walk around the house and do a number of short videos. This is how I come into the house. This is my kitchen. Cause often the kitchen is the tiled area where they spend, they'd spend a lot of their living time. Um, and it's often a dangerous area. So if we can see those with videos and pass comments, yeah, it's a very, very, te- we must use technology. That's all. We actually yeah. have a podcast on technology in the veterinary world. Um, so yeah, for those of you that are interested, we will add the episode number in the um, description. I can't record it offhand. Yeah. Um, so what is the most rewarding aspect of treating Wobblers cases for you? The most rewarding aspect for me is the fact that these dogs end up with quality of life. And so they are definitely able to move and cope and be with their family for years, really for years. So, um, and there's always such, um, there's always such gratitude and that's a, an amazing aspect of our job. And I do, I, I've said it before, and I know you've said it, but you know, we perform miracles every single 
day as, as rehab practitioners. And we become so blasé, we don't even notice them anymore. Yeah. And then we got to have, you know, these clients who thought their dog's life was at an end. It couldn't move properly anymore. Whether they have surgery or not, with our regular input and their buy-in and their ability to change lifestyles and work the exercise their dogs and understand the process of what's going on those dogs can and do have full lives yeah. i mean yes they're not chasing frisbees but they are with the family they are going for walks you know they are they're alive so that yeah. is you know where the the diagnosis often we feel well now this life is going to end prematurely no you know, that's the best thing that we actually do have the knowledge and the tools to to give that patient and that family their beloved companion for longer yeah. in a positive state. Isn't it wonderful when our clients remind us about <laughs> how amazing we are? Because that's actually how it is. You know, you'll like you say, you get blase. You're just treating animals, you're doing things. And then suddenly a client will just say like, you're amazing. Like, this is amazing. And then you yeah. think like, oh, wow, actually that, that was quite amazing. I wonder what I just did, you know? Um, so it's great. When, it's great when they remind us. Um, yeah. Yeah, we definitely have one of the most rewarding jobs. Um, you know, I, it, it's very different to normal veterinary for me. I, I yeah. mean, I love normal veterinary and it was also rewarding, but this is on a very different level. Um, and I think it's also because of those relationships that we build with the clients you know we we really share their joy um yes because we get to know them and we get to know their family and get to know the pet you know personality yeah, yeah for sure and yeah. Tanya, talking about covid and technology and going online and um, one of the things that i've seen that you've got into is doing some online courses for pet owners and i really think that this is an area where us vet rehab therapists can help so much i mean one of the things that we really need to do is to increase the awareness of veterinary rehabilitation and um you know uh, lelani alvarez has done some research about vets and why they refer and why they don't and the biggest thing that came out in that research is education and that's to vets as well as to pet owners um, and so online courses is such a fabulous way to educate um, pet owners and, and, and other health, uh, pet health professionals, you know, they can also do online courses. Won't you tell us a little bit about your courses, how you decided to start them, and um, you know, if there are any vet rehab therapists that are interested in sending clients um, to, to register for your courses, you know, because a lot of us don't have time um, if we're in a very busy practice to, to give all that education. And, you know, mm. you spoke about it in the very beginning, how sometimes we just, you know, in our consults, we like give them all this information and we can completely overwhelm them. And I feel like an online course is a really great way for them to digest information mm. slowly, you know, and then be able to go back and actually get a roadmap um, of, you know, what they need to know and in what order and what they get, how they can help um, their pets. Um, so yeah. I'd love to hear about your courses and um, yeah, what you're actually doing at the moment and how you got into it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I have discovered over the years a passion for education. And, and I do believe that if our clients have information, they can make a more suitable decision. And so again, like I don't, it's, our, my job is to guide them. My job is to say, here's the information. Um, maybe you can't do the surgery and that's okay. But if you can't do the surgery, here is what is available to you. So I, over the years, have, have discovered this great passion for knowledge. And then, of course, I want to share it. And, and I had a client a, a number of years ago who said, why are you not doing workshops and things? So that was, she kind of like planted the, the seed and it's developed now with all of the restrictions we've had into um, a, a learner, an online learning platform. So we now offer courses on that platform. We're starting with um, client um, information and we've started with um, a puppy fitness, but early stage. So from sort of 10 weeks to four months. And it is in weekly bite-sized sort of little chunks. So it's literally 10 minutes 
um, of time and sometimes even less um, to teach you from a puppy perspective what you can actually do to get your puppy to grow into a um, an able adult, an able-bodied adult. We are, There's also one on um, canine hip dysplasia. Um, because I think that's another topic where, um, again, it feels like a death sentence. So it's also in bite-sized chunks, and it runs over four weeks, I think. Um, and then I have plans to also add some things like basic first aid. And I say that with, you know, in inverted commas, not to replace us as vets. But, you know, it's the middle of the night, and now your dog is vomiting. <laughs> And, and maybe it's 90 minutes to the emergency vet. So there are plans to, to launch that in the next few months. And so we want to grow it and I'm happy for feedback. And, um, and yeah, so the, the site to go to, can I give it to you? Yes, please. Yeah, www.doctor, like in dr, Tanya Grantham, uh, .co .za. Ah, Perfect. So all and one word. Mm. I'll put that in the description. So um, for those of you that are listening that don't have a pen and paper, maybe you're in the car, um, you can hop over to the description. That's really yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, congratulations. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, it's the kind of information that doesn't matter where you are a pet owner in the world. You can be anywhere in the world. The information is is there for to educate. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for 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 doing that, for educating pet owners and those vet rehab therapists that you have that have cases of hip dysplasia, you know, you want to refer them um, to the course. Um, I'm sure if you've got any questions, you can reach out to Tanya. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I mean, I think the other aspect is that we have an education. And so that comes with the responsibility because there's lots of stuff online <laughs> that, um, that have come from maybe not such um educated sources uh and so yeah i you know i mean we know how to research we know how to find the relevant information we know wh where our background is so i'm also kind of like hoping that that is a good basis from which to go forward and and help people yeah brilliant yeah. tanya thank you so much for time it's been amazing chatting to you um, like I said, online pet shop members hop onto the portal. It's a really, really great webinar. I can really recommend it. Winning with Wobblers. Tanya, it's been Perfect. amazing. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. You too. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.